Hey, it's a new world, gotta adapt to it. Innovation, information, more than the average. Russian, please ignore the interruptions. Cause this is digital discussions. All right, what's up, everybody? So we are recording Digital Discussions right now. I have an amazing panel of friends. First, we'll start off with Doug Jerem. Doug, give the, give the viewers a little bit uh, of background on yourself. Yeah, you bet. Uh, thanks, Jay. Appreciate uh, you having me on. Uh, so my name is Doug Jerem. I'm Managing Director at Hanna Commercial. Uh, my practice for retail real estate brokerage, and my practice is in representing uh, startups, emerging brands, and direct-to-consumer brands uh, on, a, on a national basis, helping them uh, with everything from uh, st strategic planning, uh, all the way through the uh, the rollout and and opening of the stores. Love that, and we do similar stuff when we work together. Yep. So thank you, Doug. Uh, Gabriel Gonzalez from Regency Centers, aka CRE Nerd. My man, what's up, Gabe? What's up? How we doing, Jay? We're doing good. Always brother. fun. In the quick background. Uh, so I'm with Regency. We're a national REIT specialized in grocery anchor shopping centers. We own approximately 420 properties across the country kind of through the Sun Belt of the United States. And I do the leasing in South Florida, Dade and Broward counties, uh, a little over 3 million square feet, predominantly grocery anchor shopping centers. Excellent, very good. And last but never least, my man, Matt Shendell. Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I own a restaurant management marketing company called Page Concepts. Uh, our lead flagship brand is the Ainsworth uh, Sports Bar. We've been in business about 11 years with that brand have multiple concepts and brands and I'm, you know, essentially a restaurant tour here in New York. Love that. And we go, we go way back, man, through the, uh, the nightclub days, the restaurant days. And yes. you've done an amazing job in that space. I can't wait to hear about, uh, about our topic today. We're going to, we're going to talk about the reopening of the economy and uh, yes. as, as tenants start to get reopened here. Uh, obviously we're in different locations, but uh, Matt, uh, Doug and I are in, in New York, different parts of New York, but in New York and Gabe, you're in Florida. Uh, and since you have the widest net uh, as far as categories go and, and tenants, Gabe, why don't you just give us your thoughts on, uh, on, on some things that, you know, tenants are encountering as they get reopened. I mean, it's definitely a challenge as we're getting back, trying to get back to normal. Uh, we're obviously seeing the impact that fitness and food uses are going to have to go through getting back open. Uh, I can say I'm down in Miami-Dade County. We were super disappointed um, that Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach were left out of Florida's reopening. So we are still closed in these three counties. Um, we understand why, though, it's what's happening with population down here. Um, I was just talking to a restaurateur before this, and he's trying to figure out how to put more tables and chairs outside just to kind of overcome, because he can only have 25% of his normal seating occupancy inside. Um, I'm a little concerned for like my clothing stores, my apparel guys, things that are not daily needs. You know, how quickly can people start shopping again is making me a little nervous. Um, and I'm just worried for my guys. You know, these are mom and pops who they put everything in their line to get open. And the longer it takes to reopen, you know, it's just getting harder for them. And uh, Matt, you know, curious to hear your thoughts since you are a tenant and you're a restaurateur, what are, what are your thoughts on getting reopened here? You know, the problem with, with my industry is the word open is very ambiguous, right? What does open mean for a restaurant? So my, my main brand, the Ainsworth, we are a, you know, known as a, a really high end lifestyle brand sports bar. And like most restaurants in New York, being crowded and being busy is a big part of the experience, right? So Fine, and, and Jay, you know this from all your, a lot of QSR experience, a lot of the brands you've rolled out. Fine dining is kind of gone passe, and this is going to make it where it might reverse course. Where now, you know, being in a super crowded bar or restaurant might be so far off the grid for a long time that you know we might be open, and 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 landlords might hear, hey, the rent clock starts again, and you're reopened. But what does open mean? If I'm at a 25 percent capacity, it's to me, it's a, for my brand, it's the same as being closed. Right. So it's almost worse because at least now I can say, hey, Mr. Landlord, hey, 
whoever, we're closed, we can't open work with us. At some point, they're going to say, hey, you guys can open. And if your revenues aren't there, that's a whole nother conversation. So it's, it's, it's very ambiguous as to what open means. You know, we have a restaurant in Kansas City that we're opening in two weeks. Everyone got excited. We had, I had a Zoom call with my company this morning about Kansas City. And we have to move half the tables out. The tables have to be six feet apart. You have to literally put tape on the floor and show your, your, your metrics, which, again, you're taking away all the sexy, fun experience. So people go to a restaurant for an experience. Yeah. Um, so I think what it's going to do, it's going to push delivery to the forefront. It's going to push QSR to the forefront. It's going to push, you have to really be nimble and change your business model. But as far as being open, the word open is, they need to start defining that more and get granular on what that means for New York, because otherwise the open won't be open for a long time. Yeah, no, Matt, point. Doug, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I had a question for Matt. It's a bit micro, but you're running a sports bar. There's no sports. What do you? That's my, do you that's have, my other problem. <laughs> do you have a plan? <laughs> what are you showing? Games Doug. from the '90s. You know, I mean, um, it, again, again, open, right? So we're open, and there's no football, and there's no baseball, and there's no no college football. What are, what are we open for? So. Again, for my industry, and, 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 you know, me and Jay swim in the same, you know, ponds as far as the larger restaurant players in New York, the, well, people go out in New York for a nightlife experience, and, and that yeah. is going to be really diminished and watered down and diluted for a long time. So it might, it might turn into, you know, the land of just quick serve and, and fast casuals and delivery, and, and, and we might change our model. But, you know, without sports, it's, it's a whole – I mean, but how does a landlord interpret that in, in a negotiation conversation? Mm-hmm. But there's no oh. sports. The landlord's going to say, I don't know what that means. It's not on your lease. There's no, we got well, force majeure. We well, got, landlord, you know, we got a little more on the no sports. Sports. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> right. we, don't, we don't have a no sports clause in your lease. So, like, you know, those are things that are, this is all uncharted territory that for people like me, it's a day to day, wake up in the morning and deal with, like, okay, what's new? Okay, now we got to put masking tape on the floor. I mean, I wouldn't want to go to a restaurant that I had to, like, but walk up like, masking tape path through the restaurant to get to the so yeah. i think it's going to really be you know the word open for new york and new york metro is completely different than middle america and what, what's going on there they need to really they need to start thinking about that because it's not just yay we're open yeah and those conversations yeah. really need to happen with the landlords too so like what you just talked about hey i'm a sports bar i live and die by what the sport is what's driving people in here to have an event here so what's driving them here if there's nothing to watch on the tv and, it, and that, there's got to be open line of communication. What I have seen some restaurants do with the whole tape thing, especially here in Wynwood, is they're getting them graphically designed to match the aesthetics of the store. So you still have to have the space showing, you know, six feet apart and all that, but they're working it into the, the I guess, the brand, the aesthetics, right. rather than just sticking That's masking all, tape on the floor. That's all well and good, but at the end of the day, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a function. It takes away. Well, no, yeah. it's a function of the economics, right? I mean, if Matt's only open, a, uh, available, uh, if he's only allowed to open at 25, 30% capacity and has to pay 100% of rent, you know, how the hell yeah. is he supposed to be open for more than a few months before he has to close again, but this time for good, right? Doug, what are your thoughts be- on that, on that yeah. bridge to the vaccine? I mean, that's what we're all talking about here, that, you know? That that's the right. That's like the thousand dollar question. That's to me, that's everything. And I keep, you know, in the, in the things that I uh, writing about and, and things that I'm commenting on that I'm, I personally have the belief that that's what it's all about. The social distancing, all of the measures outside of hygiene, because I think that's here to stay. I think, yeah, those type of, right. yeah, the sanitizing measures, I think those, they make sense. They're just good practice anyway. But beyond that, it, I don't believe that social distancing measures are permanent. I think they're here is, until there's either a vaccine or a treatment and then it ends because that's what people want. That's human nature. Uh, you know, I've said, you know, we didn't evolve as a species because the first time a saber tooth tiger killed our friend, Did you we stayed in the cave. Saber? Yeah, there you go. Just curious. Hey, Saber, plug. Tooth Tiger. Famous uh, plug. It's amazing. Uh, but, Saber you know, plug. if if that's what had happened, we would have never evolved because we would have stayed in the cave and died. But we didn't. We came out. We kept going. We were, you know, fight through the um, through that fear. And, and I think that's the same thing that will happen here when we get across the river there to to having uh, a vaccine or, or a um, uh, treatment. Uh, how long that is? 
don't know. And that's the scary part for everybody. Uh, restaurants are at the top of the list, uh, you know, and, and then it cascades on down from there. Matt, has there been anything that, you know, do, do you feel like uh, the restaurant category as a whole, you know, is obviously one of the most impacted by, by this? And I just feel like there's no, I, I don't want to use the term special treatment, but there's almost no specific consideration for, you know, the restaurant hospitality industry, uh, even with the PPP loan process, like if, if anybody actually got money from the PPP loan process, they're still not necessarily uh, able to hire people back because they're not open and they have to spend the money within the eight weeks of receiving it. So the whole thing seems broken. Right. I mean, PPP was not made for the restaurant industry. They, they, it's just not it doesn't fit. It's square peg round hole. Right? In other words, especially in New York, you know, first of all, I'm on, I, I, you know, everyone I spoke to has still not received money and they're frustrated with the process. And then on top of that, even if you did, if I received money today, I, I'm not hiring people for closed restaurants. So it's kind of, it doesn't make sense. And it doesn't, it doesn't really work for what we're doing. So, you know, I, I think, you know, if, if you look at the other cities in, in, in middle America that are coming around quicker than New York, I think the government has to really take a regional look at this and not just a, a wide net macro look at what they're doing because it's going to be different. And New York and New Jersey, are unfortunately, the last two cities that come online, I think, from this whole thing. Yeah. Um, you, you've got another yeah. problem, right? Is that uh, right now until the end of July, anybody's making less than, at least in New York, less than $19 an hour. They're not, probably not coming back to work. Right. Yeah. A lot of them aren't because they're making more money staying home. There's well, a lot. I, of I mean, I, I think being a business owner, the pro, the PPP to me, I think rent should have been the first thing that was more accessibly addressed with PPP. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? In other words, you know, if you're if you're up on your PPP math, it's twenty five percent of the money could be used for for rent and prior mm -hmm. obligations. But to me, as a you know, this is all I, this is what I do for a living. So this is I want to solidify my leases and make sure I'm okay for the next five to ten years. To me, I'd rather be able to go to these landlords and, and Gabriel, you've probably been dealing with this on a daily basis, but you know, go, go to these landlords and say, hey, I want to be here for another 10 years. How do we structure that? I have cash from the government to use. You know, people who are taking the approach of, you know, I'm not paying, that's my answer. I don't think they're going to get very far. And Gabriel, you're laughing because you probably had a lot of those calls every day. But, you know, I, I think, but the government's not giving people the ammunition to say, hey, you missed a landlord, I want to pay. I got some PPP money. Let's get a new lease. Let's restructure. Let's do percentage rent for the next year. Let, let, let's grow back up. So basically, they're saying, here's PPP money. You can't use it for hiring because your stores are closed. You only use a small portion for rent. Go get them. And that's where we're at right now in New York. So, and, and most of the country. But the, the rent thing to me, if I, can, if I know I have new leases and my leases are crystallized and I'm good there, the rest of me, I can figure out, but not knowing where that is, is, is that uncertainty is killing most operators, I think. In New York. Yeah, there's uncertainty. You have no idea. Do you need to hire one person? Am I opening up next week and a month from now doing 10 people? Am I doing takeout only? There's right. so much gray, murky water. And I agree with you. The PPP is not the solution. It's not helping. Uh, I mean, I'm uncertainty seeing... to me is how much rent do I owe? I don't know how much rent I owe. I have no idea, right? Like that's, the, most operators are saying, I don't know. Am I paying March? Am I paying April? Is May forgiven? Is the government going to come up with a plan? So I think, you know, that, that's, that's the real uncertainty is, is, is how I, you quantify that. And I think landlords are in that same position. They're like, is my mortgage due? Are you going to work right. with me? Are you going to have that conversation? So then it becomes this domino effect of where if my lender's leaning on me, I got to go to my tenants and say, what can you do? And then you go back with the plan. So, you're, so it's this, that's why I go back to my first point. Communication is key. We got to be having these conversations. We proactively across the country started talking to every single tenant one by one. What's going on? What is your story? What are you seeing? What are your funds? Are you open? Are you closed? So that we know, hey, this pool can pay. This pool is closed. They have no money. This pool got PPP money. This is what we can expect. And that's what we're trying to do to be proactive. We're not putting our head in the sand because this is a real problem. And we all got to work together to survive. Yeah, another, another thing that, you know, concerns me is that the, the, the restaurant, hospitality, fitness, wellness, you know, these sectors have been propping up retail real estate, you know, as, as everything's continued to evolve over the years. And uh, the Amazon effect, obviously, and, and you know, a lot of uh, 
internet businesses having an impact on brick and mortar. And now you have uh, those categories that I just mentioned are some of the most impact categories. You know, Gabe, Doug, what, what do you guys see happening, uh, you know, for retail in general uh, over the next call 24 months? <laughs> you want to take that one, Doug? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 um, I think it's category by category, right? So, you know, fitness, which I do a lot in, uh, I'd rather be in boutique than in, than a general fitness provider. I think yeah. that it's a very difficult, the mid market general fitness guys are going to have an incredibly difficult time on the, on the bar, you know, on the uh, discount end planet fitness, um, because of the price of the membership, you're going to get a lot more leniency from your customers. There's still a lot of customers that um, are not going to focus as much on that cost. But in that middle market with you know, a facility that can be very full with people at any given time, um, I think that's going to be tough for people to get back to anytime soon. Boutique, if it's done right, I think, um, I think most of their business models actually do work at least to a point where it makes sense to operate with a lower capacity. So let's say 10 people in a class and you can, you know, a lot of the discussions are, you know, mapping out on the floor. This is your box. This is your box. This is your box. You stand here, you stand here, you stand here. We conduct the class. Everybody leaves in this fashion. We clean the place like crazy in between. We make that very public of what we're doing. And, and I think that works. I think there are enough people that are dying to get back to it, that there'll be business there for them. So I, I think that most of those guys can find a way uh, to make it happen. But, you know, the 24 hour fitnesses and those type of guys, I think have a, a tough row and may, yeah, I don't know. They'll all make it to the other side. I would agree with you, especially because not just be careful here, the square footage that these guys are absorbing the planet mm -hmm. fitnesses and these guys, you're taking 20,000 feet. Even if you're in the low double digits, you're still, your rent obligations multiplied over 50 stores. That's a massive number to pay when you're not open. Right. If I'm a boutique guy, and I think you hit the nail right on the head, they are more designed to have, hey, I can do five members in a class and do more classes in a day and still be able to charge my, my, my premium membership to pay my bills. You can't do that in these larger gyms. That's so right. either they're going to have to... I think that, you know, that I, there are all different types of, you know, boutique fitness concepts, and I think some will fare better than others. Um, and I think, you know, quite honestly, that that they're, they're, that category's possibly oversaturated. So, you know, a lot of, uh, just, uh, so a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the companies, you know, are, are, we're not necessarily doing well pre coronavirus, right? Yeah. So, I think those ones will will go away, like everything else, like the like the department. You know, this is this is like the mm -hmm. accelerator, right? You know, this is and and Matt, I'm sure you'd agree in the restaurant space. You had a lot of people uh, hanging on, just you know, basically making it another month, making it another month. Yeah, it's gonna wipe out. You know, this is like a a, a cleansing, a major cleansing of all industries. Um, but you know, back to the gym thing. You know, if you have to make an appointment to go to uh, LA fitness, you know, and, and <laughs> which machines you want to work out on for that hour. I mean, really? Yeah. That, you know, think about awesome. the social aspect of, you know, the restaurant business and the fitness business have the same social draw. People go to gyms to meet people, you know, and they go to restaurants to meet people, whether it's new people or see friends or work. And if you eliminate that element of, you know, being social and interacting, those businesses, I think crumble because mm -hmm. that's the core of those businesses. Yeah. You know, so I think that's what landlords need to think about is, yeah, we're open and yeah, we have, you know, we can do certain things, but, if, you know, especially coming from a guy in New York City where the rents are, you know, the, the, the real estate market was pretty maxed out before Corona. I, I don't, I, don't, I think people, have, as far as rent per, per square foot pricing, I think people have to think about the, all these businesses just won't be the same for, for a while. So opening a gym won't be what it meant to open a gym in you know, February 1 of 2019. It'll be up to 2020. It will be different. It'll be different meaning of opening. And to Jay's point, most restaurateurs barely make money now, especially in New York when your, rent, your occupancy costs go, what, like 12 to 15%, unfortunately, Jay? You try to keep it at 10, but let's be honest, you can't. Um, I don't see how these people who – we're barely making it before and eking out three to five percent EBITDA. And I want you, why would you want to just, it's going to be a really uphill climb for a while for people like that. So it's going to be a huge cleansing. 
Yep. I mean, look, the the restaurants also have it really bad in that, you know, okay, I can go out, but what's the environment, right? You were kind of touching on that. You know, my servers are all wearing masks and I'm separated. It's quiet. Unless yep. you're out with a really fun group of people that you're not socially distancing from, are you, are you really sure you want to go out and have that experience? It, it, I know it, at least, you know, the takeout aspect, you know, there's can more of that can happen in places where the restaurants just aren't able to operate now. But, you know, I don't know how attractive the restaurants are going to be until there's, you know, not the social distancing. You know what? It's also interesting. I think, you know, the, the, the habit breaking and the habit forming since this is going on for so long, right? You know, so for somebody who uses boutique fitness daily, sometimes multiple times a day, I'm stuck at home figuring out how to work out either on my laptop or on my Peloton or whatever it is. And I realize instead of leaving my house at 6.15 a.m. to drive 25 minutes to hop into a 45 minute hour, you know, class and then drive home, shower and get to my office by, you know, 7.45 a.m. It's like, wow, I just saved two hours by hopping on my Peloton. Um, will that stick a little bit more than it would have previously? And then also with food, right? It's like right now, I'm literally eating for survival. I don't know if you watch my Insta stories, right? You eat like cup of noodles for lunch or like <laughs> every single day. So it's like, I, I'm living an experiment right now. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, if I could just live off of these things. But in all seriousness, I mean, it, you know, it's almost like it, it'll be interesting Everyone, are you guys chomping at the bit to go out the minute that a restaurant's open? Are you like, oh my God, I need to go eat at my favorite restaurant? And I mean, it's, you're not gonna have the same experience. Is the, is the food gonna taste as good w with your mask on? <laughs> you take it off. <laughs> How's that work? I'm dying to go out yeah. to a restaurant. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be the first one there, but I'll probably be number three. Yeah. Uh, I'm, dying I'm dying to go. My vote probably doesn't count as much. It's by it's a loaded a loaded vote, but I'm dying to go. No, but I think I think the majority of people are honestly. I think people yeah. are very frustrated and and really excited to be able to yeah. get back to some sense of normalcy. I, I, I think that's the thing. getting back to normal. And if you tell me, hey, to get back to normal, you got to wear a mask and you got to stand three feet apart or six feet apart to go out with a group of guys. I'll I'll do that just to just to have a drink just to have mm -hmm. a, a burger just to be out you tell me what i got to do to do it and i'll do it just to go experience that again even if it's not a hundred percent of the experience so i mean a lot of the people i'm talking to here are you going to go out or not a lot of people that i've spoken to kind of are especially that i think that under 50 crowd that going out was just a part of our life and grabbing a drink having a meeting for lunch like we we want to do those things again so I'm I'm dying for that to happen in any capacity. Maybe Jay, maybe I'm biased Jay, because I'm a landlord. Yeah, I have a question for you guys. As far as you know, you guys are more in the corporate world than than the restaurant business, right? And I noticed, you know, Jay, I follow your stuff all the time, and you know, you, you're living on Zoom lately, right? Like the rest of the world. But do you think that this becomes the norm and group, you know? operational meetings become zoom calls and office hours become less and you don't have to come yeah. to work from home right. becomes more every, like every people CEO. working from home and less office yeah. space needs and every ceo that i've spoken to uh has said that they've learned quite a bit about productivity working remotely and it's been positive yep um you know i, I was just listening to uh, to the radio on my way in and they were talking about how you know office space just uh, the office market in New York City is off by 50%. And when you, when you think about, again, habits and what seemed normal, you know, before everybody was forced to work from home overnight, you know, you, this is like a crazy opportunity for people like myself who are constantly thinking about how I can do something better, more efficient, cut costs, you know, all of those things. Absolutely, man. I, I, I actually prefer uh, Zoom sales meetings uh, a lot more than I do uh, getting everybody in, in a conference room uh, squeezed in once a week. I think they're more efficient. They're, they, they can be more effective. Um, and, you know, for somebody who's growing a national business like myself, it's, you know, I, I'm jumping on a plane constantly. You know, I never even thought that I could just do this and have uh, a, a discussion with folks. Uh, and, and still, you know, get home and have dinner with my kids. So I think 
it's changing my my perspective on so much and it's definitely going to impact how i grow saber for sure I, I i would agree that i don't think it'll be a hundred percent replacement but i think a lot of companies are going to look at do i really need five thousand square feet of office or can i function with 2800 square feet of office and have some of this the supportive staff working from their house do i need to have a weekly in-person meeting or can i do that meeting once a month and the other three weeks do it on zoom so I think productivity, how we think of work from home, everyone figured out very quickly when it was survive or die, we're going to have to make this work. And I think through this process, we're seeing that a lot of employees are much more happier not spending an hour in a commute each way. They're more productive. They're eating healthier. They're working out. And if you give them an option to work one or two days from home, they're just a happier employee. And I think productivity over the long term, over the macro will be higher, in my opinion. And that's a good point, though, Gabe, because real quickly, like, you know, for me, I'm, I literally order lunch at my desk if I'm in one of my offices. Like, the lunch is just delivered there, and I eat it while I'm in a meeting, and, you know, the go, go, go mentality. Matt, you're the same way, which is why you're going insane, because you're stuck. <laughs> in, in yes. Your home. Uh, it, it's crazy, but, you know, for me, it's also like, I'm like, holy shit, like by not going to the Starbucks drive through or walking into Starbucks, Doug, you and I have a lot of history with Starbucks, um, three, four times a day, I'm not kidding, you know, like, like I'm, I spend easily, call it $25 a day at Starbucks, easily. Oh my gosh. And, you better and, be owning that Starbucks and, stuff. And by the way, anytime I'm at Starbucks with anybody around me, I'm paying for everybody. So it's probably more than that. Um, and, and I'm proud to do it by the way. Uh, but, but the reality is again, like I'm starting to get used to just using my Starbucks, uh, little K cup in my Keurig. So it's like, and, and by the way, bringing my lunch, which I haven't done since like seventh grade, like, you know what I'm saying? I'm just, <laughs> so I realized that there's other ways of doing things now, to be honest, I was so damn busy before that I didn't even know that I could like do these things. You know, now it's like, okay, I have no choice. And, I, and some of these things are going to stick. I agree. Same with the coffee. I couldn't agree more. I think, yeah, I you're, think drinking, you're drinking just, Cuban coffee. I am. <laughs> but hey, that's a buck 50 down for at least Cuban coffee. It's a buck 50. And I used to go through three or four of these a day. So, I mean. So you don't sleep. You know, actually I feel like drinking one before bed. So you <laughs> Crazy. Jay, do you I, think a lot of these brands are going to have to go to automation? Because we've, we're, we've really discussed not having servers and automation and, you know, tablets and, you know, tablets and, you know, you wipe down your screen when you get in and, you know, that kind of world for the next year to who knows how long, because I think that would eliminate the weirdness of like a server and a mask coming. Like, I think that mm -hmm. what Doug was saying to his point it's going to be like a creepy, weird restaurant world, right? <laughs> Where everyone's at mass and who knows what, like maybe, you know, the digital, you know, kiosk age is what, where I think a lot of restaurants are going to have to go for a while, which might help in New York where the, where the, the labor rates are so high. But, you know, I think that might be another thing that people are going to have to start investing in infrastructure and, 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 and you know, real good, you know, networks and, and really redo their whole, you know, it, it, uh, wireless systems in the restaurants and start becoming more handheld and more more terminal based because I think having these servers and having these people with you know in the standoffish capacity is just not going to work. No, for sure, Doug. You you could chime in here, but you know I think we're yeah. we're entering a touchless society. You know, so go ahead. yeah. I mean, anybody who knows me, I'm I living for that day. I've always been a huge fan of you know more tech and those things. Yeah, but I want to be able to leave the house without my wallet and just leave with my phone and everything is in there all the way down to you know, my identification, um, which we're not there yet. But um, I think in the, for restaurants in the right, you know, in a lot of the applications uh, and certainly in the short term, I think would be really good. I don't think all restaurants should be that way. There's some, you know, well, well-run restaurants with well-trained staff. That's part of why you go that they add to your experience. Uh, but there are lots and lots of restaurants where that's really, that's not the thing and, and would you know, benefit in the long run. You know, this is uh, really compressing so many timelines of adoption of, you know, of weeding out the, the week in retail, 
you know, all these things that were going to take five or 10 years, you know, are, are being smashed into, you know, into six months and you know, some good, some not so good, but they really are forcing a, a lot of things to happen very, very quickly. Uh, one of the things actually I wanted to uh, touch on uh, that's popped up in the last couple of days, so I think is great is, you know, real uh, full scale curbside pickup systems that the landlords are buying into and taking the initiative on. Uh, Gabe, you'll have to tell us where you are. I couldn't see, find anything this morning publicly, but you know, we've got uh, federal announced one. Kimco is the first Kimco. one. Yeah. Uh, Phillips Edison, you know, and they look great. And I think that that's a, a, something that would have taken a really long time to, to really get the landlords to the point where they were doing it rather than select tenants wanting to. But now that's happening, and I think it's only going to get better. You know, they've got, yeah, I, I can see very quickly systems where if you're in a tenant in the shopping center, the landlord has an app that, tie, that ties into your system. So your customers, you get notified through when your customers show up and where they are. And, you know, zoning permitting things like a poor co-share so people can stay dry, you know, as if you've got these common areas where people have to bring merchandise or food out to, uh, you know, to, to enable that transaction to be pleasant in any weather. You know, lots of stuff like that. There's a lot of places where you can go with it. Uh, but just the fact that it's starting um, is awesome. And I, and I think that's a really positive thing that, that is coming out of this. For sure. I, I know we're having conversations about it. I definitely mm -hmm. want to, I'm the tech guy here. So I want to, yes, yes, yeah. let's do it all. I think it's the future. I think as a landlord, if you're thinking about, you know, I'm going to be doing less deals, obviously, over the next 12 to 24 months, and I want to attract the best of the best operators that are in the market, then I, as a landlord, got to be investing in doing the best that I can do to attract those people. So if I'm competing with a, a Kimco or Phillips Edison Center, and they have, you know, curbside pickup set up, and they have all this digital automation set up for their tenants, I'm going to lose that good tenant 10 out of 10 times, because if the rates are the same, they're going to that project. So it's something that as a landlord, you have to take into consideration. And whether you want to or not, it's the reality of the world we're living in. And I applaud Kimco, Phillips, all those guys. That's a huge applause for me because that's very smart, very proactive versus yeah. waiting. Uh, and I think whatever landlords are proactive now are going to win this game over the next two, three years. These are, these are the new amenities, right? You know, yeah, for sure. How, how, you know, having hand washing stations in, in an office building, right? Like, you know, all yeah. of those are going to be amenities. Uh, very for sure. um, are you guys hearing of, I'm just curious, any, uh, anything in other states that are, that are being implemented, um, you know, with, like, for instance, I, I did see a few photos of restaurants with plexiglass dividers at tables. Um, I've heard that, you know, Orange Theory Fitness and Barry's are putting plexiglass between the, the treadmills. I don't know, you know, exactly how accurate that is, but I've heard these different things. Have you guys heard any anything like that with uh, with dividers or anything? So, yeah, that I mean, in nail same. salons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so a couple, there's uh, interesting in the personal services, I was thinking about this, you know, you've got kind of some uh, haves and have nots. I think um, waxing and cosmetic dermatology uh, are actually in a really good position to come back uh, pretty, I won't say easily, but they're already you know, in a place where they have to be very uh, health and safety conscious before this happened. So yeah. it's not a big pivot for them to do some additional things and make people comfortable. It's, I think it's a lot harder for the nail salon, the hair salon, uh, you know, manicures, pedicures, you know, those environments are not thought of in the same way from a cleanliness standpoint. And I think they have a harder job to get people comfortable. Um, but I do think some of the, some of the other, uh, personal services will fare better and, and get people in more quickly. I, agree. I think, yeah, go ahead, Gabe. No, no, I was just saying with the nail salons, I'm already seeing the whole plexi setup where, you know, you stick your hand under the plexiglass, they're wearing gloves on the other side of it and you pick out your color. So you're not having that face to face without the plexi. So I'm starting to see that pop up. Uh, yeah. and that's really creative mm. hair. Mm. I don't know how you do that. How do you, how do you do someone's hair? Uh, that, that's going to be a challenge to me, I think. Matt, what about cleaning? You know, obviously, I, I feel like uh, it's going to be survival of the of the cleanest. You know, in a <laughs> kind of way. Uh, so, how ha, have you thought about like how how you're going to what kind of process you're going to have to implement, obviously, to keep the customers and the and the employees 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the cloak and dagger, I know in New York, a lot of the health department stuff was, you know, cloak and dagger for gear. I think that'll be, it'll be an even playing field. Everyone will have to do things X, Y, Z to, to, to stay open. I think it'll bring all the restaurants into a cleaner, you know, new era of much cleaner and much, much better service, uh, climate of restaurants. I think, no, I, I don't know if the plexiglass between tables and all that, it's really going to work. I don't, I don't think operator i mean speaking for myself i wouldn't want to really go that route i'd rather figure out different options i think to to, to doug's point you know getting things on social media showing that you're 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 best in class with who you're using for cleaning hiring you know san, sanitation crews and sanitizing crews that come in every week and spray down your restaurant and really putting that out there when Six months ago, people would say, "Ew, why is my restaurant showing me that they're spraying the bathrooms?" <laughs> now people are going to be like, "Wow, that's great! They're spraying the bathrooms. I want to go there." So I think it's going to really turn it upside down, where people are going to say, "Wow, I've you know I've noticed on Instagram that this restaurant is doing an amazing job with cleaning and, and being sanitary." And I think the people who get ahead of that now, and and again from a social media standpoint, start doing content with that and getting that out there, will we'll, we'll win the day sooner. Um, I think it's just going to raise the bar and the expectations that everything will have to just be done at a higher level, especially in New York City for a while. Like, it's hard to police. You know, it's over, you know, I think there's 5,000 restaurants in New York. I think it's hard to police all that correctly. I think now it'll all be on an even playing field. Yeah. By the way, if you're looking for a, bu a business idea to pivot to, I'm pretty sure a cleaning company would be a good place to go. Yes. These days. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, uh, I actually have, have a friend who's, uh, who's, who's, who's gone that direction and it's interesting because they, they work with like, a, with it's, it's not chemical based, which mm -hmm. I think is extremely important, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially in the restaurant space, right? Because when my office building's being sterilized, I like leave, I don't want to be anywhere near it because of my concern about being around the chemicals. Um, so I think that type of stuff is going to be, become very important. And Matt, I think it was a very uh, good point to mention, like, you know, using social media to help your customers actually feel safe. Yeah. You know, honestly, the, the little that I, that I go out into public right now, it's like I have my mask on, I have my gloves on, and I'm doing my thing, but I'm so neurotic that I still like, I get in my car, I take the, mat, the gloves off and put them in a bag and all that other stuff. And then I'm like, wait, did I touch like this? Did I, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> did I touch the door? Did I touch the window? What did I touch? <laughs> it's crazy, honestly. I have a whole system. I have a whole process now for for, for right. which hand I use the door and where do the gloves go and all right, where's the hand? Snack? Oh wait, did I touch the steering wheel? It's so, frustrating. Like any other, you know, business with critical processes, you just gotta have a procedure that you stick to every time. Uh, yeah, that's then it takes away that anxiety because you're like, I just just do it the same way every time. And then you think about it less, less anxiety, and, and it makes going out easier then. Yeah, but there's going to be, that's going to be a big adjustment for everybody is, is finding their, you know, yeah. their, their strategy and, and their process for just keeping themselves sane, yeah. you know, that they, they don't have to lay in bed at night before they close their eyes. Like, did I really touch that thing without Carol in my hands? Yeah. I I <laughs> um, any, any, uh, any thoughts before we close up here what comments questions I, I just think i think that the going you know to, to your first question of the day about being open i think a lot of people are hung up on on that right now especially in my industry when are you going to be open and open 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 might be four years from now i, I don't know you know and, and you know watching us watching the yeah. yankees yeah. world series game at a sports bar meant x eight weeks ago it's going to mean why now and all and all that and i think you know just getting that definition down pad and getting granular in that and getting what does it mean to have rent like you know someone the other day said to me well they suspended evictions for 90 days and i said that's great doesn't mean they suspended rent like you know a lot of people interpret these things and and abatement what versus deferral like there are a lot of terms that are whizzed around that the four of us probably you know we, we deal with these terms all day long but I think for, for New York and, and the New York Metro and, and the bigger cities, they really have to start getting clarity and, and, and a lot of granular definitions about what open means and what this means and what's going to happen. Because someone said to me the other day, 
you must, you got to really want to be in the restaurant business now. And I thought to myself, Hmm, you know, like it's a <laughs> simple comment, but like, it's really going to be the people who really want to do this because it, it was a brutal business before. And now it's going to be, you know, it's that much more challenging. So that those are my parting thoughts. It's just what is open going to mean? And, and what does that look like? And not having the celebration. Yeah. We're open. I mean, phase three, whatever. I don't know what that means. Phase three. And everyone got confused with phases yesterday with the governor. So, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, that, that is cleared up for me, for at least personally. And I think, you know, New York City is a different animal and, and that's where the majority of, of your businesses are. So I think you're in a, a different position than a lot of people that might be watching this, um, you know, and, and obviously a New York land, a New York City landlord is a very different mentality than, uh, you know, a shopping center REIT that owns, you know, shopping centers across the country. Mm -hmm. And um, the reality is it's going to take a long time for the market to correct and and market rent the, for more new market rents to even be formed because a new york city landlord is not even going to admit that there's anything going on it's going to be like what do you mean <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about right. yeah our rent's still 250 a foot what are you talking about? <laughs> of course it is so you know or better, be yeah, what about the people who have really good leases right we're exactly. paying 60 yeah. a foot now the landlords are going to say okay if yeah. I get 150 a foot. It works both ways, right? right. It works both ways. So I think, you know, and, and for you, Matt, it's a very in specific individual conversation with each each landlord. And, and you know, everybody on this, on this Zoom knows that a landlord and tenant relationship is a partnership, you know, whether mm -hmm. or not both parties want to admit that if the partnership's not working, you know, it's going to break. But you, everybody has to... Uh, work towards what's fair for for both parties and uh and i think you know you you suggested some creative ways it, it's just not possible for landlords to take the position that they'll defer rent for 60 or 90 days and tack it on to the rest of the rent for the remainder of the year when tenants are going to be open for business at a reduced capacity and can't even afford the rent that they were paying based on the pro forma that had a <laughs> 50 seats in their restaurant, right. not 35. Like, so, you know, that's going to take a long time. It's not going to be an overnight process. And it's going to be, I think, very, very specific on a case by case basis. Yeah. You know, yeah. agreed. Agreed. Yeah, there's, there's no one solution to all. It's like you just said, how, how do you, how do you tell a tenant to pay X when they can only do Y? And do you force him out of business? Do you work with him? Those are really hard conversations that we're having to have. It's, it's really tough. You know, I was having a conversation yesterday with the broker because we're going through the spreadsheet and basically making some decisions like, you know, who do I want to fight for? Who's already out? You know, these are people's families, how they pay their bills. And it's, you know, last night I was laying in bed is like, you know, did I make the right decision? Did I, did I fight for this tenant enough? Did I not fight for, you know, and it's, it's going to be a tough few months, but I, I think tenants and landlords have to work together. It's the only way that we're going to survive this landlords have pressure points, tenants have pressure points. You know, how can we, they say a good negotiations with both parties are just a little bit unhappy. So we're going to kind of have to get to that point where we're, we're both given some and getting some and uh, we'll see how this works out. Doug, last thoughts. Take us out of here. All right. So uh, some good news, bad news. You know, bad news is it's going to take longer than everybody thinks to get to the other side of the river. Good news is when we get there, it's going to look a lot like it did you know, before this all started. Some things will be different, but mostly those will be positive changes. Um, and, yeah, the new normal will be okay and it'll be good. Uh, but it's not going to be quick. And that's the, and in, in that Valley is there's a lot of pain that's going to be happening and that's, yeah, it's really sad. Um, but in the end, yeah, we'll get, we will get there. Yep. Great thoughts. I appreciate you guys for joining me today and you guys have a run hey, you're welcome. The rest of your week. You too. Thanks Jay. Thanks Take guys. Care, Thank you, you guys. Cause this is digital discussions.